Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I wanted to address one thing uh, that's uh, uh, pretty common feedback when I was talking to people about my talk, is that uh, you know maybe launch something before you then do then do a talk about what you have done as we are launching next week. Uh, so uh, let's just uh, yeah a couple of disclaimers. Uh, this is our debut title. It's called Die for Valhalla. Uh, our, when, when I'm talking about Kickstarter, our Kickstarter campaign was a tiny one. We asked for $5,000. We reached a little over $7,000. And we are launching next week, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, the pl plan of the talk is I will talk about the platforms thing, and then I will do uh, a little pre-mortem exercise uh, and explain. Yeah, I'll explain in a minute. So uh, about the platforms things. Uh, so from our experiences uh, as a small studio, you should go and talk to the platforms as, as early as possible. Uh, even if you are not at the moment sure if you are going to do the port in-house or through an external third party, uh, you know, getting out there, talking to them, they will, you know, at those companies there are people whose job is to help you out, to explain the processes to you and throw, you know, important links at you. So you will get, have a b better understanding. And when talking to those people, everything takes time. So first being accepted, you know, even before the agreement part, it will take time. For us, it, for Nintendo Switch, it, it took us a year before we got to the agreement stage. And we, you know, every three months, we met them at an event and we talked to them. Uh, then setup takes time. So, you know, you got to the agreement stage, but you still have, you know, this back and forth uh, with them, then getting hardware takes time. And the good thing is, you know, usually making the first playable on a console, on a new console is easy thing. It's like, you know, it's exciting and it will boost your morale, uh, but uh, then the technical requirements and performance are the real grind of the porting. And, you know, especially if the structure is wrong. So the, the earlier, you know what challenges lay ahead, the better for your you know, production. So, and another thing is, when talking about you know, PlayStation, Switch, and Xbox One, you're not talking to three companies, you're talking to probably even seven companies because you, know, you have PlayStation Europe, you have PlayStation America, you have their Japanese counterparts. Uh, Xbox One is easy because, you know, idea to Xbox is one, the only global program. Uh, but, you know, then everything, you have to go through similar processes on the platforms with each partner. So, how to get your game on Xbox One? Pretty easy. Go to apply to the idea to Xbox program, meet the person. So, there is a, so if you are a smaller developer, that's an assumption I make. Uh, there is a pattern here. There is al always a website that you have to go to register, and there usually is a person you have to go to talk to, because you know those those are like queue-based systems. You go apply to the program, and then you have to meet them constantly to push you through the queue. Uh, so you know there are Xbox people at this event. Uh, there are PlayStation people at this event, so uh, go talk to them. One thing, uh, you know, PlayStation is a bit, a bit stricter. You don't have to be a company, but you have to have a static IP and a, a public, non-public domain email address. So, uh, yeah. So, and, and that's another, like, recent thing, because historically in the past few years, you know, something has changed. PlayStation has come to an event. Wow, so some, maybe something you know important has happened in the last year. Uh, yeah. So the sexy one, of course, is the Switch. So you have to. Th there is also a specific portal you have to go to register, and then you have to go and bash them about that you want your game on their platform. So you know, the the the, the your approach to porting is like. For, what I would like to 
you know, uh, give a certain weight to is even if you have a small game, if it's a PC game, if you are not doing a port or not thinking about going console, you are leaving money on the table. So whether you want to do it in-house or you want to have a third party do it for you, you still should consider doing a console port for your PC game because, you know, especially now on Steam, there's plenty of fish in the sea. Uh, so consoles are slightly easier, I hope. Uh, so when doing a port, you know, there are, so wh whether you decide to do it in-house or through a third party, you know, there are, for each console, there are a lot of partners you can meet here, talk to them, and they will do the port happily for you. You can finance it, you know, through a multiple ways. You, you don't have to pay for the ports. You can, you know, do a ref share. So for, for whatever option you want to go for, you will find a partner probably at this event because there are like five porting companies, you know, going around asking everyone, I want to port your game. Uh, so, so that's one thing, do it in-house or uh, third party through a, thir through a third party. Or you can, so, so, so the, that's the one question. And the other question is, do I want it, you know, to do, do it single threaded? So like, I first finish my PC game, then I do a certain console, then I do another port. Or you can try to do it multi-threaded way, like we have done. So we decided early because, you know, we have arguably a game better suited for consoles than for PC. So we were working from the early days, we decided that we do want to have the game on consoles. So at every stage, at every milestone of dev development, we made sure the game works on every platform as soon as we got to the platform, of course, because some of them took longer to, to get through, uh, you know, with the agreements and s getting hardware. So, but those always, uh, you know, I'll have those little uh, qu quotes from people I talked to recently. So I talked to a guy from a big porting company, you know, just a friendly chat, and he said that they don't touch anything that is not done. So from their philosophy, it's like if you work through a third party, the single-threaded way is the way because, you know, there is, if the game changes too much through, during development, you are may be paying a couple times more than if you would pay if you did it single-threaded. But, you know, if you talk to me, let's talk about your multi-threaded development of your game. Uh, so the thing is, uh, if you do certain decisions early, if, if you understand them, uh, like limitations of the platforms, they, you will not have those difficult choices, like what do I have to cut out of my game that is ready? How do I, you know, have the platform parity? Not because pl platforms require that, maybe they do, uh, but that's NDA. Uh, but also you have to be fair to your players. Okay, so there's, there's a second thing, a second part of my talk. I, wanted, I want to do, you know, this pre-mortem for our game exercise with you guys. Uh, I will not ask questions, so uh, yeah, so this was just me talking. So uh, identifying top three risks and top three opportunities for Die for Valhalla and our plans to seizing them and you know, avoiding the disaster. So I think you should, if you are on a development side of a you know, smaller studio, you have to wear a lot of hats, and one of those hats should be preventing a disaster at launch. So, you know, top three risks. Uh, I, I focus on, on one risk here. It's, you know, re in related to people things. So there are three groups of people in the world. Like, you know, there are those people who have never heard of your game. There are those people who heard of your game, but, you know, they, for some reason, are not buying it now. Maybe they never will, or they are waiting for a reason to buy. A reason to buy can be, you know, something like a sale. They are waiting for the 90% sale or something. And there are those you know, who, who buy it and then they, they like it or they don't. So the three risks here are that you know, not enough people hear about your game, not enough people convert through your you know, sales funnel, and you know, third risk is people who buy it don't like it. You know, just why didn't you do a good game? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I let, last year at GDC, I talked to the Broforce guy. Uh, I asked them they, because they have you know this public uh, demo on the website that's practically the whole game. So they're the, giving the game away for free, and he told me that there's infinite number of people in the world, and as an indie, your problem is not how do I make them to buy my game, but how do I tell them that my game exists? Uh, so, you know, you have this, this, like, you have those two parts of the funeral. So, not first thing, like, first pool, you have to make people aware of the, of the game. And then second part is you have to make them buy it. Uh, so, those are the, you know, the risk. Uh, so, this is one of the things, I think, like, the Darkwood guys did awesomely is that they, the, the, the first part, you know, people aware of the game, they, they had a huge number of people aware of, the, so t they got them to the first stage of the funnel, you know, and then the game turned out to be good, so they are converting a lot of those people as well. So, so for us, you know, not enough people hearing about it, the risk. Uh, so we, our answer to that is we do a multi-platform launch uh, we do pre-orders because this gives us, you know, free in-store visibility. Uh, we, the, we do, you know, the free marketing, Gonzo-style, you know, Reddit, um, AMEAs, and uh, influencer outreach, press outreach. So those are, you know, obvious things that you have to do. But still, you know, there is... I talked to talked to yesterday to Agostino, and he said he asked me, "Are you sending out the the Xbox you know media keys you got?" And I said, "Of course I have, because there are still people you know even w with Steam games where you have you can generate free keys and give them away to press. There are still people in small studios not doing that. Basically, you know." Starving their own, their own, you know, first funeral. Yeah. So, another thing I talked to recently was the indie PR guy who 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 told me that you know when you with a when you work with with a certain budget as an indie you don't have a lot of money, you are probably spending too much on your Facebook ads in comparison to Google AdWords or uh, you know, things that can be very, very cheap, like Reddit ads, where, where you can have very specific tar targeting for people already interested, you know, looking for game deals, and you can get there and you know, just shovel your, your game in their face for a very cheap clicks compared to what you get on Facebook. If you, especially if, like me, you are not very experienced with the Facebook's, Facebook ads system. And the second thing is, Facebook ads work the best when you feed them with your data of how do you sell. And we in indie game studios, we, like every store we work with, is a black box. We don't get the, uh, we send the data there, but we don't get back you know, an, any analytics about how the sale did. So Facebook, might not be optimal for this case. Yeah, so there's the, the second risk, not enough people converting, you know, just make a good game. But, uh, yeah, so we, we are doing, uh, you know, one thing is we d we're doing a discount plan, discount plan for the next year to avoid, you know, just hitting the 50% discount button too early, like thinking about price strategy, how, how do we want to, how long do we want to keep the price uh, of the game and keep it alive? Uh, we structured our game for adding new content so we can keep adding new worlds, hopefully adding interesting things to, uh, for new audiences. Uh, we have done some store page experiments and this is something already launched games can do as well. So, uh, like, you can't really run A/B tests on Steam, because you know. You, but but maybe you do. Maybe you can. If you are two months after launch, maybe you can do. You know, test one banner for a week and then a second banner for a week because you know the the, the number of views people coming to your page, you know, on Steam doesn't. If you are not doing a discount, it's not very 
dramatically changing. You still get a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs on your game uh, from Steam. And you can see how, you know, test, test little things like change a banner, change your order of your screenshots, change your description of the game. This is, you know, this is something obvious for people who come from the mobile world. And this is something not very many Steam developers, like, you know, PC developers think about. You should run tests how you can convert your game, uh, your play, you know, viewers to, to, to buyers. Yeah, and we also, uh, you know, have plans to engage content creators as we go, uh, adding, you know, content specific to, to YouTubers that we worked with for our stream for Valhalla thing, which I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a second. So, yeah, and if, you, if people who buy our game don't like it, our plan to respond to that is just, you'll go cry in the corner. Uh, yeah, it's just so funny. Uh, the top three opportunities for us, uh, my, like, that's, that's my take on, on our opportunities, is that there, is, there are no plans for Castle Crashers on Switch. How awesome. Like, Bahamut, they, 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 on their, there's a lot of people asking them on Twitter, there's a lot of people asking them on their forums, and they have given explicit answers that pit people is the thing they are focusing on, they, they are small, 50 or 60 people company, they can do two things at the same time, so that's an awesome news for us. Also, most of our direct competitors for st from Steam are not there yet, uh, but you know, this is uh, a little rat race. Uh, the second thing is influencers uh, are a huge opportunity, especially with our, uh, with our multi, multi platform launch we can you know this is i'm not sure if this is a good idea but it is an idea we can treat plot steam as our premium demo platform so we go to streamers and we tell them here are a couple of keys to give away and this is probably even if the the first thing is the free publicity we get from this but the second thing is this is probably not a lost sale because the person who got this the the, the game on steam First thing, they would probably never hear about the game in the first place. But the second thing, they will still want it on Switch or maybe not, not so much on the Xbox or PlayStation, but you know, high hopes for Switch. And the, the another thing is, you know, yesterday uh, or today, the answer stores uh, launched. So there's a couple of uh, Norse Viking themed things coming out recently. So this is also something we, you know, we have this opportunity for us because this is suddenly something a little bit popular than a, more popular than a year ago. Yeah, so, and this is one of the things that you can do, you know, through Go Google, if you have a direct competitor uh, who's not coming to the platform and people are looking for that specific thing, it's not easy to target those people on Facebook, but it's very easy to target those people through search, you know, then, then not necessarily Google, but other search networks as well. So, okay, the, the, the influencers thing. You know, we are doing uh, a lot of outreach, uh, but I talked to some of the, my friends here and probably not that much. We've sent out uh, about 2,000 keys already, uh, and we are a week before launch. And when I talked to, uh, you know, a popular game from last year, They've sent about 8,000 keys before launch, so we are still kind of getting there. But uh, you know, it's important to get, uh, get out there and talk to people, ask them how many keys have they sent. So you know, there's a little, there's a little piece of feedback. Yeah, we are using keymailer.co. If you're doing you know, outreach in your company, you have probably heard of it. Uh, I don't really think this is a great tool because there, there are a lot of pieces m missing from it. So you sh should still do a lot of your outreach through email because email gives you relationships with those people and Keymailer doesn't. But uh, at the same time, this can get your keys in their hands. So one of the things we have done for our Kickstarter uh, last year was uh, when sending emails to the YouTubers, we were including the key in the email 
you know, just uh, because some people will will tell you, you know, just send the email, maybe they will answer, and then I get them the the key. But that never happens. The big YouTubers nev will never respond to your email, uh, and those who reach out to you are scammers. So. For us, this worked out because some of the people who have not got back to us, you know, they, even though the, the, the key was in the email, they still have not responded to that email. Like, we haven't built a real re relationship with them, but they still have made the video for the game. Yeah, so when I talked to uh, last week uh, from this year's very popular uh, game, uh, so that's another opportunity for us. So, it, so when sending out keys, uh, you shouldn't. Pr that's, that's again, if you're doing the outreach, this is probably not very surprising to you. But you shouldn't look at the subscribers count, but you should look at their engagement. So you should look at the views on their videos, because there are a lot of YouTubers who have historically been popular. They got to their 200,000. View, subscribers, but now have like 50 views on their videos, and that's not uncommon. There are a lot of you know tiny YouTubers, like 2,000 subscribers, who are pulling in way more views than people who have t 10 times or 100 times more subscribers than they do. So uh, yeah, so the, because the, the game is bigger, they, their cut off is a thousand views per video in recent videos for those YouTubers. So that's another opportunity for us uh, because we can reach to the smaller ones as well. And they are, you know, they are not getting keys from, from the bigger companies. And in the streamer YouTuber world, there's a lot of people who know people. Like, you know, game developers tend to know game developers and streamers tend to know streamers. Uh, so you get this, I hope, <laughs> this bottom-up approach can work for us. Yeah, so th there are also some risks outside of our control, of course, like other games suddenly launching on the same date as we do. 29th May has become a very, very popular date for a game release, uh, you know, last Tuesday of the month. Uh, just before E3, that probably we could have expected that if we had some more experience, but yay, here we are. Uh, facing uh, even pretty similar game launches on the same day, uh, but we have Switch and they don't, so that's another good thing for us. Uh, fucking Moonlighter, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, this uh, healthy. Uh, competition is good for everyone, great games. Uh, yeah, so, so that's another thing. When working with uh, you know, a lot of partners, when you're doing a multi-platform launch, uh, there's a lot back and forth when setting the launch date as well. So you sacrifice velocity. So we couldn't decide a week before the launch that we are you know, just changing the date to a different uh, so, so that's you know that's kind of the um, consequences, but the, the the bad thing instead of the good thing from working with multiple platforms and launch at the same time. Yeah, so I will do a so this is a three part talk. So I'll do a micro post mortem. It's not probably good time for it just yet, but just you know hear me out. Uh, so what I think went right for us. Uh, you know, getting consoles is definitely a good thing because even in the last six months, looking at our friends' launches on Steam, you know, they are not doing very well. Uh, so there is this little hope for us. Uh, getting first playable early and iterating the game, that's another thing that I, th I guess was great thing for the quality of the game. Because we, we, we started going to events with the game um, like when it was a month in production. Uh, so we, very early, we, we had very little experience making the game. This is our debut title, and we got feedback, and we worked on another demo for the next three months, and then we got some more feedback, and now we are getting feedback that the game is actually, you know, people are surprised because what they played two years ago 
is completely different to what they play now and feels better and that's you know that's a little pat on the shoulder for my for myself another thing that we went right for us is surviving and you know that's not a common thing uh indie studio can say a week before launch uh but here we are uh because of getting on consoles early we can already you know we we know that even if the game fails the studio will not fail because we can we can and we already do contract work for you know other studios that may be a little more successful that we have than we have with our you know one thing that uh went kind of right is our kickstarter campaign uh we thank you uh, uh it's uh we i i think that it was a very you know positive thing for the for the game because we as again as a tiny studio we got to learn how to communicate about our game what sticks and what doesn't stick at all uh we the Kickstarter was successful and you know it covered the costs so it turned out to be net positive and visibility and beta testers that came from Kickstarter were basically a free addition to that so uh you know even if the if it's it's no longer something probably Kickstarter is no longer something you can fund the game with maybe you never could but it's still a great marketing tool and uh, yeah well, so what went wrong uh building a community uh a week before launch and i'm not really sure what does that even mean building a community for a, for a game that's not yet launched uh you know we have some facebook likes we have some conversation happening on our steam page but are those people our community what 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 that would even mean we are not engaging them that you know all the time we don't have that very many beta testers i don't think uh uh as an indie studio idea we you know in, before our game launches uh i don't think you know everyone says build a community but what does that even mean uh yes yeah, so another thing that went pretty wrong was that uh yeah we will finish it in a year and here we are to well maybe three years later uh yeah and we definitely don't have enough drama around our studio uh as that would probably help with the marketing so those are th three things i think went uh wrong but uh you know maybe less yeah so uh that's something not very many people share and i wanted to talk about this because i believe sharing information uh might cause that we, people will be more open about sharing their information with us so our game so that's 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 you know pretty when i got you know got back to our budget ex excel sheet and when when i ac actually counted how much the game cost it is you know even to me even though i handled the business and you know invoices and things this is a surprising thing that the game has cost almost half a million zlotys so it's slightly over uh, 100,000 euro uh so that's you know this as to me as you know someone not coming from a business background that sounds like a lot of money but at the same time and I can't possibly see how we could spend less like how we could make the game of this quality faster uh and not very even here talking to to other indie studios not very many people think about how much their game is costing them and uh yeah so here's the data so we've spent you can see the numbers this is in zlotus i haven't really thought that thing little little thing out so we spent 320,000 slots on development so here's the salaries the ratings the localization and music uh one thing i was very very surprised about is how much we actually spent about at uh, on pr and marketing we've been you know to a lot of events through the to the development cycle and i think this was 
this was awesome for us as a learning experience as a studio, and also pretty good for the you know the the social proof that then gets you through you know you have people that know people and those people can help you out with little things. Uh, so this is ba basically the networking cost for the game and for the company, and that's a pretty big number for a small studio, I think. Yeah, and mask legal accounting, rent hardware, software. Maybe that's a development cost, but I, I kind of think this is something separate. Yes, yeah, so our break even uh, for the game is at 20,000 copies across platforms. Uh, so that's another thing every small studio should probably think about very, very early, is that how much are the game is going to cost us, maybe even count in the op, you know, lost opportunity costs, like I could probably be doing something else in that time, and is this a good thing for myself, for my family, to be making an indie game? And, and maybe it isn't. Uh, and maybe you will, you know, if you make that decision now, you will be in a better place in three years than if you have become an indie developer. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sorry to say that, but that's the harsh reality most of us face. Uh, and that's, uh, that's another number. I, when, I, when, I, when I told the number to, to, the, to the friends at the company, they were suddenly pretty happy because we are, you know, we, we, we are a week before lunch and we are, you know, 5% in on the way to the break even. So I don't really know what that means, but, you know, he's just sharing the, the number of you guys and maybe we can talk about your pre order numbers and how do they, uh, what, what they meant for your game, game's launches. Talking to other indie developers at a small event on Friday, uh, some of them told me that they see real, really no correlation between their sales in pre-orders and, uh, and their sales in the first week because on some platforms they sold very little and their launches w went great and on some they sold more in the pre-orders then later, you know, the, the first weeks didn't really look that great. So, you know, I guess for huge companies, uh, those numbers are very different than for the small companies as well. So, yeah, just the f food for thought. Yeah, so that's it. That's all I wanted to share with you, and thank you for coming.